Hi, welcome to Storymakers. I'm Rocco Steno, and today, today, we have Elizabeth Bird. Now, who is Elizabeth Bird? She is the Youth Materials Specialist at NYPL, better known as New York Public Library, but she also is a blogger for School Library Journal and an author of Wild Things. Welcome, Betsy. Thank you so much for having me. So, who is Betsy Bird? Who is Betsy Bird? Betsy Bird is a jack of all trades, you know, I, I, and master of none. Um, I do all sorts of things. I, I cover the librarian beat, I blog, I review, I write. Blogging, Fuse 8. First of all, some people may know where the name came from, but for those who don't know, remind us. Oh, it's, it's, about a, it's from a car part. It's from a 1989 Buick Century car part. Uh, back when I had just graduated from college, I put my, took my key out of my car one day and the little locks went up and down and up and down and up and down. And I thought, oh, that's not good. And I took it into a mechanic thinking I was going to have to spend the money I did not have, having, as I mentioned, just graduated from college. And he looked at it and he reached into the glove compartment and pulled out fuse number eight and said, if you pull this out, you won't have any horns or windshield wipers or radio, but, it won't make your locks go up and down because your electrical system is completely shut, shut down. Years later, my husband, who is a filmmaker, was looking for a name for his production company. And I was like, hey, because I was constantly pulling this fuse out, in and out. I was like, you can call it a, a fuse number eight production. And he said, no, no. And I was like, well, then I shall call something a fuse number eight production and it shall be glorious. And I don't know what it is yet, but it'll be great. And then when I needed a name for my blog, that was the one that I did, but it has Thing to do with children's books. But now it's a piece of uh, kid lit trivia, I guess. It is, and I've been given more fuse related necklaces and fuse jewelry than, than you would believe. Fuse art. Speaking of uh, kid lit stories, Wild Things, your yes. book that you uh, co authored with uh, Julie Danielson and Peter Saruta, mm. uh, is uh, out with, by Candlewick, yes. and it says Acts of Mischief in yes. Children's literature. There's many interesting, very interesting stories about some uh, famous uh, kid lit people. There are. Yeah, so how did the book come to be? Here in New York you hear these stories all the time. Stories, you know, the cocktail parties, you know, the people who've been around for a long time. It's like, well, have you ever heard the story about the dead cat? Let me tell you this one. And I thought, oh, it would be neat if these were all in a, in a book somewhere. And then I, I, there were these two bloggers and uh, Julie Danielson, who runs Seven Impossible Things Before Breakfast, which is the best picture book illustration blog out there. I'm just going to say that because it's true. And then there was Peter Sruda, who ran the Collecting Children's Books blog, and which was the best historical children's uh, book blog out there. So I went to them and I said, let's do a book together. I have an agent. And they were like, okay. And we were like, what should we do our book about? And we sort of hammered some ideas out and then we just sort of came up with sort of the concept for this book. And uh, Candlewick was very interested. Ah, and, uh, and unfortunately, uh, Peter Saruta passed away before the book he was uh, released. Which was terrible. Nice. Um, he was absolutely brilliant. Um, but fortunately, we have this book to, to help us remember him. And of course, his blog, Collecting Children's Books, is still up. And you can read all the archives. And they're marvelous. Well, one of my favorite parts of the uh, book is the index. Because if you uh, have a particular book that you would like, or an author that you'd like to find the uh, dirt on, it mm -hmm. makes it very it's interesting. Convenient. But I was actually surprised that the uh, book was as, uh, was about 270 pages. Yes. Was that, but I understand that the original it was uh, manuscript. slightly larger, just a teensy bit. Um, and this is sort of a big fish story. Every time I tell this, like it'd be, it was 500 pages. It was actually, I believe it was 700 pages, like, like a stack of papers this thick. And we sent it into our, our fantastic editor, Liz Bicknell at Candlewick, who to her credit began to edit it before Sanity took over. And she was like, what am I doing? No, 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 no. We're not going to publish a 700 plus page. We edit this down. And we're like, oh. So we had to take out just loads of stuff. And uh, yeah, it, it shrank significantly. So you must have enough information for another book. We did. We had enough information for probably three or four books. Um, what we decided to do with the stories we didn't use uh, is we actually created a Wild Things website. And on it, we posted our favorite of the stories that got cut. Tell us one of your favorite stories that did not make it into the book. This actually was a story that I thought did make the cut for quite some time. 
And then when I realized that it didn't, it, it broke my little heart. Um, this was the story of when Hans Christian Andersen went to stay with Charles Dickens. Um, they were contemporaries. They admired one another's work very, very much. They loved one another. And Charles Dickens, you know, they wrote to one another and Charles Dickens said, hey, if you ever want to stay with me sometime, come on by, it'll be great. And Hans Christian Andersen took him up on the deal and stayed for what I believe was something like five weeks. Five weeks, and he was not an easy house guest. He was the kind of house guest who didn't really want to talk to anybody but Charles Dickens. If he got a bad review, and he did, he would fling himself onto the lawn and only Charles Dickens could persuade him to come back into the house. Um, his Charles Dickens' daughter called him the bony boar. Uh, couldn't stand the man. And they would try to like gently suggest, you know, maybe, maybe it's time for you to go. He did not take hints. Um, if you read Hans Christian Andersen's diary from the time, this was an Elysian time. This was, this was the best moment of his life. He and Charles Dickens are best buds forever. And Charles Dickens doesn't mention Hans Christian Andersen in any of his writings, but um, the story has it that he, he wrote on a piece of paper and put in the guest room basically the equivalent of like, Hans Christian Andersen stayed in this room forever, which his daughter made him like take down. Um, so they didn't have a record of that. So right. that story is on the website, plus It is others. on the website, and many, many more. So give us a story, one of your favorites from the book. Okay. This is a story that a lot of people thought they knew, and we actually did a little original research to find out the actual end of this story. So many of us know that um, for Make Way for Ducklings, Robert McCloskey lived in Greenwich Village. Uh, he lived with Marc Simon. Uh, they shared an apartment together, and to draw the ducklings, he got some ducklings and some mallards, and they were in his tiny Greenwich Village apartment running around, and Life Magazine was charmed by this and actually did a whole you know, article on them, like, oh, look at the cute ducklings crawling all over this illustrator. But the problem with this is the ducklings um, go very fast, and it is hard to draw very fast ducklings. So he would get red wine, and they would drink it, and that would slow him down a tad. <laughs> and, he'd be, and the mallard loved it, it would chase away all the other ducks and drink the red wine. So a lot of people know this stuff. Um, now, when he was done with the ducks, for whatever reason, um, didn't want to just put them in a park somewhere, so he tried to sell them to butchers around the city, uh, none of which were having it. Apparently, his country boy looks were very suspicious to the New York butchers of the area. So he got back to the apartment late, you know, sweating with a box full of angry, hungry, hungry ducks. Um, so that was as much of the story as we knew. Gary Schmidt, uh, who is an author in mm -hmm. his own right, fantastic guy, did a biography of Robert McCloskey and had talked to Marc Simon about all this. And so I asked him, I was like, so what happened to the ducks? Um, and here's where the, the story takes sort of a dour turn. Um, he was like, well, they went to a lovely farm. I was like, oh, that's lovely. And were eaten by a fox. Ooh, uh. Maybe not all of them. So, but that was the actual fate of the ducklings. Yeah, a, yeah. a drunk and dead ducks. Huh? Drunk, dead ducks. ducks. Oh yes. my. Uh, and uh, for some reason, I really enjoy that story because we got the ending on it. We got the scoop. Well, one of the uh, interesting facts that I learned was that uh, Wanda uh, Gag of a million, millions of cats? Millions of cats. cats. Billions yeah. of cats. Billions, billions, billions of trillions of Millions of cats, of cats. yes. Uh, was a pretty active uh, woman. Quite. Got around a bit, she did, yes. Uh, enjoyed her time in New York fully. Um, that she was the most explicit, though. George Selden would give her, a, of a Cricket in Times Square, would give her a run for her money. But um, yeah, she, you know, her diaries were kept intact and were published. Um, oh, they are available. A, well, a, they were published a, in a, yeah, a book that I had found, section large, but I believe they were published actually in the day. They were made a public and, and many of the people mentioned in them wished they had not been and would have liked them rescinded, but yes. So, so. I think, oh, do you remember the title of the book? It is not in English, so no, oh, I don't, oh, it's but it not? is referenced in my book, so you can find it. Oh, um, so people, there are two copies in New York Public Library at the uh, Mid Manhattan branch. If anyone are, they, wants to see are, them. Yes. are they available for interlibrary loan? I'm sure they are. Oh. I'm sure they are. I'm, yes, absolutely. Yes. Anyone can read them. And what fun reading they are. 
you'll never ride the subway the same way again. This is true. This is true. Yes. And we mentioned Fuse 8. Mm -hmm. And how old is Fuse 8? Fuse 8 technically started as a blogger blog. Um, back in 2006, um, SLJ had done an article on why you should blog for your school library. And I had read and been like, this blogging thing sounds like it might be fun. I think I shall try it. And so I, I wanted to make one for my library branch. You know, here's what's happening, and here's a review, and what you know. And New York Public Library at the time was like, no, 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 no. We can't edit you. You would be representing us, and we wouldn't have, you know, control over what you're saying. I was like, well, then I will make my own blog, and and I will call it Fuse and Breach, and it will be about children's books, but not about my library branch. And it just sort of took off from there. In 2007, SLJ um, purchased it. Um, they basically said to me, like, you can do exactly what you're doing, uh, but we'll pay you. And I was like, that sounds like a good deal. And so that is how it happened. Terrific. Yeah. And, uh, and over the course of years, uh, you've met some uh, controversy. Yes, um, I have learned many lessons over the years. For example, if you criticize a group that has a message board, um, that group will take a field trip to your blog to tell you why you are a bad person. So the Amazon Vine program, I once decided to criticize. This is a program where uh, everyday people can get early uh, copies of children's books, adult books, everything, I think. And when the book is published, the reviews will come out and all the Vine reviews will be first. And I saw some problematic possible things about this, particularly when um, these people would sort of misinterpret the books that they were given or, you know, say things like, my two-year-old couldn't stand this chapter book for 18-year-olds. My goodness. And um, so I criticized it. And they have a message board. And they weren't very happy with me for criticizing it in any way, shape, or form. So they took a little field trip to my site, which made my stats very high, but made for a very unpleasant day reading my own comments. So there was that. Uh, other controversies that we've had. Um, oh, well, I found also that um, usually I will not critically review a book by a debut author or illustrator. Um, generally speaking, not a good idea. Um, you know, it's their first book, and you know, their heart's really in. So even if I dislike it enormously, I'm like, you know, it's their first book. I will make an exception if the book is on, uh, you know, is a National Book Award nominee, uh, or you know, if it wins a Newbery Honor or something, or if it's uh, on the New York Times bestseller list, I figure, you know, at that point, uh, you you can take it. You get the thick skin. Um, so there was a certain book that got on the New York Times bestseller list. A uh, little book called The Day the Crans Quit, and I saw some problematic things with that book but hedged the review. The review is the most hedged, like, it begins with me saying, maybe it's just me, it's probably just me. I'm crazy, I don't know, but there's this thing I saw, and maybe it's just me, I don't know. And so that's basically the tone of the entire review. And you would have thought that I had put a hit on the man's pussycat, the way people <laughs> reacted. They were just like, oh my God, she's criticizing that book. And it just blew up. To the point where I started, like, you sh if you want to read crazy comments that just spiral slowly into madness, highly recommend the comments on that review. Um, yay. Well, you do have a big following, and mm -hmm. uh, that uh, many authors would just love when you discuss their books. In a uh, nice way. In a nice in a way. Sweet way. Yes. So you have this sort of responsibility or this, let's say, power. Power. Yes. Uh, do you feel like you have power? I don't have clearly enough power because Day of the Grand Squid is still the biggest hit of all time. <laughs> so clearly I have no power whatsoever. Um, I have an inordinate amount of it in weird ways. Uh, because I am buying for a huge library system at the same time as having a blog that many people do read, which is awfully nice of them. Um, you know, I'm on different award committees um, for different types of awards. You know, there was an award committee I was on for historical American fiction for children, and then there's a math award committee that I'm on. So, you know, there are those things that I do as well. Um, and then I write these blog posts on potential Newbery and Caldecott winners. Doesn't have any influence on what will actually win the Newbery and Caldecott, but it does have quite a bit of influence on 
what is in the mock Newberry and mock Caldecotts around the country, which means sales. So that's a good thing right there. So if there's something I really love and I think it has a chance, I can at least get a discussion going, even though it has no influence on what it's actually gonna win. So yes, I have, I have weird power, mm -hmm. um, but it's not serious power. I mean, I can't influence sales significantly, right. um, but I can start conversations. I'm a, I'm a conversation starter. Well, that's okay. There you go. Betsy, that's the conversation That's what I like. So that, know me is that.